Um, let's give it a sec. Uh, so welcome. Uh, what we'd like to do is just a quick round of introductions. Um, just, you know, you say your name and where you're calling from. How did Dexter used to do this? He used to go up the coast? Yeah, up the coast or down the coast. Uh, we'll see how my geography is. So uh, <laughs> let's start in um, Virginia. Is anyone on from Virginia? Or DC? Yeah, sure. You're out there, but it's Becky with the Urban, urban uh, Forestry Division. Hey. Welcome. This is this is Yasha McGarrick, also with Urban Forestry Division, DC Department of Transportation. Great, welcome. Um, we Maryland. also have West Virginia here. Let, let's oh, not West forget Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, David. Frank Rogers, Kikapin Institute. Sorry, I'm not sharing my camera. Um, I'm trying to save my bandwidth so I don't get dropped out on the internet here. Good morning, everyone. Frank Rogers, mm -hmm. Kikapin Institute. Uh, we're the lead organization for urban forestry in the West Virginia Chesapeake Bay program. Welcome. Do we have anybody from Maryland? Sorry, I had to unmute. Carol Ann Barth, Prince George's County. So we kind of curve around DC. So depending on where we are in the county, we're north or south. All right, Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Good to see you, Kinsey. This is Krista Heinlein uh, with the Forest Service at the Philadelphia Urban Field Station. Um, and I've actually, you know, had the occasion to meet Mark once or twice over um, over the years, but also we're always intrigued by the progress with the FIA. So good to see everybody. I saw that uh, Charlie Murphy from Baltimore just popped in. Charlie, do you want to introduce yourself? We already hit Maryland. Apologies. Yeah, I had a chief of staff just pulled me into a meeting real quick. Uh, uh, Charles Murphy, I run the Tree Baltimore program in Baltimore City. We're in the Department of Recreation and Parks within Baltimore. Thanks. All right, Pennsylvania, New York. I think there are a couple of us, but I can go first. <laughs> My name is Brittany Winky. I'm with the Natural Areas Conservancy in New York City, um, an or a nonprofit organization dedicated to stewarding and working with the Parks Department on all of the natural urban forests and wetlands in New York City. Hi, Brittany. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name's Nicole Henderson. I'm the NYC Park Stewardship Manager working with volunteers in the city. All right. What's next? Connecticut, Rhode Island? <laughs> I'm not fam as familiar with the Northeast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got Connecticut, Rhode Island, and then we'll move up to Massachusetts. I think it's just Massachusetts left, although maybe, oh, New Jersey, thank you. Oh, we can't forget our brethren, brothers and sisters in Jersey. All right, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. We have three of us here from Speak for the Trees. Um, in Boston, me, and then Natalie, another with Speak for the Trees. Oh, I'm Elizabeth, also with Speak for the Trees. Um, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont. Who did we miss? Did we hear from Tim? All right, well, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> so I wanna just share, uh, we'll take an, a couple of announcements before we get there and introduce Mark. I just wanted to share the amazing work that um, Elizabeth here has done to update our website. Um, it's a lot easier to navigate and to read. Um, so it's urbanecologycollaborative.com. Uh, we're continuing to update it with some of the videos as we organize this, but you can, the best is you can actually read some of the pages here, including our members. So these are all beautifully organized. Um, if you or your organization wants to be included here, please let us know. 
And then uh, we're gonna up, be updating this more regularly with future and past sessions here, including video. So stay tuned for that. But thank you, Elizabeth, for, for that amazing work. So can I just ask a quick question there? Yes. I went to the website to, you know, sign up and legitimately become a member instead of just hanging around with y'all. And uh, apparently that page is not functioning. So I haven't tried it, I guess. Which page this is month. that? Um, where it says if you're interested in joining. Uh, hold on, let me make sure. It might, it might be working now. Elizabeth, okay. remember if you broke that, if you fixed that broken link? Um, I'm not sure. Is it, is it this one? Yeah. So if you click here, it now works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank Unless you for letting a, us know. Yeah. Unless there's another one, there might be another link somewhere, but I think that works now if that's the same one. And I did get it forwarded to me. Tim. You want to introduce yourself real quick? Hi, everyone. Sorry, uh, my audio wasn't working, so uh, missed all the earlier introductions. But um, I'm Tim Eiffel, and I am the Associate Director of Trees with uh, Pennsylvania Horticultural Society uh, based in Philly. Welcome. Um, so quick announcements. Any announcements of note that people want to share with the group before we move on and introduce Mark? Now, Kinsey, you want to make your quick announcement? Uh, sure, yeah. So next next month, we will be meeting um, on June 16th. So mark that down on your calendars if you haven't already. And we will be hearing from Casey Yitoralde. Um, and those of you in DC, if I pronounce that wrong, please let me know. Um, and they work for the Forest Health and they're a Forest Health and Community Outreach Specialist for the Urban Forestry Division of the District of Columbia Department of Transportation. So we'll be excited to hear um, updates on projects happening in DC from Casey. Any other announcements? Thank you, Kinsey. All right, well, without further ado then, uh, it's my uh, distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Mark Majowski here with us today. Um, I actually met Mark pre-pandemic. He came down to Boston and we sat in uh, the, D the Department of Conservation and Recreation's little shed in Belmont. And there were some great people around the table and we were talking about FIA stuff and I had never heard of it, I was new to the field. There are all these researchers there asking very pointed and targeted questions. And I felt like I was a fish out of water with some of the questions I was asking. But uh, Mark has done, uh, is here today to share with us his work um, at the US Forest, USDA Forest Service in the field of what's called Forest Inventory and Analysis or FIA. It's also an urban FIA program that's been growing over the past decade or so, I think, right, Mark? Maybe a little less. About eight years now. Yeah. And so he's been with the program for 30 years, working throughout most of the Midwest, and is currently the national lead coordinating lead coordinator um, and, and development and implementation of the Urban FIA program uh, with a large team, including federal, state, local, and university cooperations across the country. So without further ado, Mark, the, the audience, the table is yours. Thank you. Are, are you able to see the screen? The slides? You're going to have to, you're going to have to share a screen again. Okay. There we go, that works now. We're on the second slide, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, well, th th thanks for having me. It's always great to share some time with some very passionate people about urban forests and, and forests in general. And I think uh, I've been at this 30 years or so, but I've only really been involved in the urban side of things since about um, 2013. And when we started down in Baltimore in 2014, where I, I guess I first met uh, Charlie. So good to see you again, Charlie. I can't believe it's already been this many, uh, eight, eight years or so. Time does fly. Uh, that's so wild. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's spooky. We're, we're, it's kind of funny. We're, we're on a, all of our work's done on a seven year cycle. So it takes, we do a, a subset of the plots each year. After seven years, we restart with the first set of plots. And our goal is always to get to that sweet spot once we get that first baseline data behind us. And we, whenever I talk to folks, seven years seems so far away, but it's amazing that this year we'll be um, wrap, wrapping up our, our first full data set for, um, for um, Baltimore. So it's pretty exciting. I'm understanding that many of you might not be familiar with the urban, urban FIA program or even the FIA program in, in general. I think um, one of my biggest challenges I see as, as I travel around the country is there's a whole crazy big network of folks that focus on what we, what we might call traditional forests and then another whole network of folks that might concentrate on urban forests. And it seems like it seems like they never seem to interact enough. There's always us and them and different different types of perspectives. And one of my biggest challenges continues to be to, to get that conversation going but between those two groups that forests and forestry is the same. It's just it's just one ecosystem versus another ecosystem. It's all just the way trees grow. And for some reason over the years, I, I still have trouble getting these these two networks to mix together. And um, so hopefully today I get to talk to a lot more people and I'll, I'll share our, our traditional program and our urban program and how they're related and how we're using um, both those attempts, both, both those programs to get a real good complete picture of all the trees within the country. So I guess to start out, um, you know, a, a, a simple question. Um, somebody asked me once one evening at happy hour, which was odd, how many trees are there in the world? And, I said, well, I guess I really don't know. I guess I, I would just say a lot. So I got back to a hotel that night and looked it up and they, they said there are about th 3 trillion trees in the world. So the next day the meeting went back to my, my buddy that asked me that question the night before. I said, yeah, yeah there's three, 3 trillion trees in the world. He goes, how in the world did you figure that out? I go, well, the, the internet told me. But, but in reality, I mean, when, when he, he looked back at me saying, how do you know that? Do, do people actually go out there and count them? And more or less, I guess that's, kind of what the FIA program does. I mean, we don't necessarily count every tree, but we do, we do a systematic sample across the entire country to sample the country's trees to see what's growing out there and how things change over time. And this all started back in 1928. Um, Congress asked us to more or less do just that, um, keep, a, keep an inventory of the present and prospective conditions of our forests and rangelands across the country. So we've been, we've been at this since the late 20s across the entire country. And some states are more involved than others. We've probably got the two states that really stick out to me are, are Maine and Minnesota, both of which have had 15 or 16 complete inventories by now. So lots of change data over time. But it all, all started about 90 years ago or so. And our whole goal is to tell the story of, of those trees and how they change over time. So if I, or if I were to drive the describe the FIA program is pretty much made up of three main components. The, the first being long-term monitoring. Um, where, where are the, what, what are the forested areas and where are they located around the country? And what, once we will lo locate and describe them, what, what are they made up of? What, what's the species composition, the size classes and the overall health of the trees? And then most of all, how, how, does, how does that forest change over time? through tree, tree growth, mortality, and what, what's removed by harvest. And the second component, um, we, look, we call it timber product outputs or, or wood flows. Pretty much once we've measured what's in the forest, we're also measuring what's coming out of the forest in terms of products. And the, and the third piece is taking a, a, social a social view of it in terms of what people think, what people think of, of, of their forests or, or, or urban green spaces. So these are our main three components of the um, FIA program. 
historically um traditional FIA yes and, and even within urban FIA these three main components um also apply on the urban side of the, the ledger also so after 90 years or so of all those remeasurements of all those all those complete data sets it's pretty easy for me to say um back here in Minnesota that this the state's 34 percent forested about 12 billion trees growing on FIA defined forest land throughout the state and that aspen would be my most numerous forest type. I, I can build upon that and even focus in on that there's over a billion ash trees throughout the state with the diameter one inch or greater. And that makes up about 8% of the, the total tree total trees in Minnesota. And I can even spatially see where those trees exist. So I've, I've got a really good understanding of the ash resource within Minnesota, how it's changing over time. But once I move out of traditional forest land, traditional FIA defined forest land, I really don't know much about the ash, ash resource in urban areas. What, what's its distribution and how it's changing over time? So that's always been a big gap in our, in our over, overall data. So with, with the 2014 Farm Bill, it's kind of shifted our perspective. It asked, it asked us, the Farm Bill asked us to expand our current operations into urban areas. So outside of the traditional FIA defined forest areas, into more urban areas. So moving away from that forest centric approach to a more holistic whole, all tree approach on capturing those trees out west in, in the rangeland areas, capturing trees downtown, allowing us to get a, a good picture of, of trees across the entire urban to rural gradient from, from downtown to the suburbs to more rural sites back into um, agricultural and even forested sites again. That was a really big change for us after after 90 years of focusing specifically on FIA defined forest land. Moving away from moving away from that mindset of cords and boards and timber production to the um, other benefits that all trees provide, regardless of where they're located. Um, the ecosystem, ecosystem benefits the trees do provide for us, like stormwater um, mitigation, health benefits, property value changes. And in, in doing so, we kind of tried to take an approach where we treat a tree as a tree, we collect that same data set on a tree in the, in the traditional forest as we would as a tree in rangeland or, or a tree downtown. Apply that same data set to the same data variables to all these trees, regardless of where they're growing. And in order to do so, we, we, um, we rely on the, the experience of the traditional FIA program and also the, the 30 years or so experience that um, the of Noax I tree shops provided doing more inventories. Um, in more um, urbanized areas. I think traditionally FIAs would, would have been called the, the nation's forest census. And I think you know, with these changes, I guess I, I could even say that maybe, we, maybe we've moved beyond that to the nation's urban forest census. And, and I would hope you know, in, in the years to come that maybe I could sit here and say, um, we're the nation's tree census, looking at all trees regardless of where they're growing across that whole urban to rural gradient. And also I'd like, like to point out that um, it's, it's not like it's not FIA versus iTree. I, iTree is a part of FIA. It's, it's all one program. They're just they're kind of just two separate units within the same overall FIA program. So by, by teaming up and, and utilizing the best of the best from both worlds, combining those two programs, our goal was a st st strategic long-term monitoring system. More big picture. I, I can say a lot about the country. I can say a lot about a state. I can say some, some more about a city. But the further I drill down, the less accurate my data is. So I'm, I'm really looking big picture, strategic level information across the board. And then the resulting system um, was built to be able to um, work well on both urban and rural ecosystems, operate on both public and private lands and be, and be an annualized, meaning you know, it, it's not just a snapshot in time, it's, it's a continuous, it's, it's a movie. Um, Dick Rideout from the Wisconsin DNR that helped craft some of the farm bill language he, he would always point this out. It's, it's not a snapshot, it's, it's a movie that all of our plots, although we're working on a, on a seven year cycle, as soon as we hit year eight, we're remeasuring the trees we measured back in year one. And, and we're doing that on into, into the future indefinitely. So once you get that first data set after seven years, you're building upon that, getting remeasurement data for the next seven years. But after that point, then you're just looking at rolling averages moving forward. So you get a lot of real, real, real time updates in terms of um, change. And that's pretty much the premise of our, our entire program. So that was kind of why we're doing it in terms of where we're doing it. 
we're focused, the Farm Bill said urban areas, we focus on the US census definition of urban areas. And those areas shown here in the, the yellowish, orangeish color, so those are situations where we've got a population density of greater than 500 per square mile associated with a town or city with a population density above 2,500. So our, our whole focus is on these 68 million acres across, across those 68 million, we'll put in, so it's a very large rough, rough scale. We put in one sample for every 6,000 acres, the same as we do in our, in our traditional program of forest land, one plot for every 6,000 acres. In addition to that, we'd, we'd, we'd concentrate some work on about a hundred or so of the largest cities across the country, making sure that each state has at least one city represented. So scaling that down into, let's say the, the, the Boston area, here's an example. The, the, blue, the blue background here would be the census defined urban areas. And those are the areas that we, we, would, we, would, we would sample at a rate of one plot for every 6,000 acres. And kind of looking at the, the, the big picture, especially, especially in New England, we are focused not just on Boston, but the entire state of Massachusetts. Um, that, that's the area shown all, all in blue, but also we're, we're still active throughout the state of um, New Hampshire, <clears throat> but the, the, the green plots here happen to fall in the, in the Manchester area, same with the purple plots down in, in Rhode Island. So if I looked at like the greater Boston area plus the rest of the state, that this would be my, my sample configuration. <clears throat> if I look directly at, at the Boston study area, it's just about 178 or so plots um, associated with Boston in the greater Boston metro area. So that's one plot for every 6,000 acres. Those plots are measured, one, seven, one seventh of those plots will be measured each year for seven years and year eight would start over the remeasurement process. But down here within the city limits of Boston, in addition to those 178 scattered in the metro, we'd also install 200 plots within the city limits. That's kind of like the, the basis of our entire program. And we build this city to city around, around the country. And in some, in some situations, that, that, that would be like the base federal program that I just described, but in some situations, um, state or local government decided to kick in additional dollars to enhance the program. So I'm Lisa Allen, the state forester at the time down in Missouri, she came up with additional funding to not only put 200 plots within the city limits of Kansas City and Missouri, but also add about another 200 plots to the metro area of both of those cities. And, and also, although Kansas City and St. Louis were our two target cities within the state due, due to size, she also wanted us to enter into um, Springfield, Missouri in, in the green circle. All said and done, she was happy with that, but she didn't want to wait seven years. So she also chipped in money to accelerate the sample from a seven year cycle down to a th three year cycle. So that, that was just one way that a, a state shipped in dollars to enhance the, the base federal program. Another example would be in, in Wisconsin, where um, both Madison and Milwaukee were in a seven year cycle. And we would have liked, they would have liked to get that data sooner, but they, they figured they'd stick it out and wait seven years. And, and as of the end of 2021, their seven years of Yelp will have their first data set by the end of this year. But they wanted to put their investment not in, not in, excel, not in, in an acceleration. They wanted to add a five-fold increase of plots, urban plots throughout their entire state. So I think the definition of urban area is one plot for every 6,000 acres. They wanted to increase that to one plot for about about a thousand acres, and it came out to be about fifty about a thousand plots statewide, and that that would be in the you can see the little blue outlines on the map. Within those blue areas is where they squeezed in the the thousand plots, so they can talk about the statewide urban areas as well as the urban areas within their two largest cities. But move all that to a, a national perspective. Um, we, we started in 2013, got our first, got our first feet on the ground in, in Baltimore and Austin, Texas in 14. Um, as of 2021, we're up to 40 cities in 28 states. And in 20 of those states, we're looking at a statewide inventory also. So that, that'd that be like where I hit Bridgeport, Connecticut, as well as the other 200 plots scattered throughout Connecticut, outside of the city limits of Bridgeport, but still contained within the urban areas in, in um, Connecticut. 
so on this map, the, the darkest gray are, are those are, are, are those 20 states where we are fully operational boots on the ground. Then, then the next lighter shade of gray would be where we have at least boots on the ground in at least one of the cities. And then the lightest gray area areas are probably the areas of um, future opportunity for us as, as funding allows. So that, that's, that's the focus of where the urban program exists. And then kind of taking it a step further, everything we're doing is large scale strategic level trying to trying to fill in the gaps that were that were left in the past from our from our forest centric approach so everything we do is based on a, a an extensive plot grid that, that's there regardless of what's underneath these plots so here's the state of new jersey our base plot grid is about almost 800 plots but because about half of those plots didn't meet the fia definition of forest land historically we didn't field visit about half of those. We would still get 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 measurements remotely, but we wouldn't we wouldn't have boots on the ground. So in a lot of cases, there we were missing that tree data on, on about half the plots in the state. But when I superimposed the urban layer on, on the state of New Jersey, about half of those that we missed are now like turned on. They'll, they'll get a field visit with or without FIA defined forest land present, and, and all those trees that we missed in the past will not be captured. So that, that was like one, one step forward towards an all tree, all lands inventory. That, that's our long-term goal. And urban has been our first step towards achieving that goal. We, we still, we're, we're still missing about 20% of the plots in New Jersey. These are most likely agricultural lands outside of urban areas, or they're in smaller urban areas associated with cities less than, this, less than a population of 2,500. So this is just, just, just a future opportunity. I'll, I'll show, I'm sure we'll get to the trees on these plots eventually as we move towards that all tree, all lands approach. But currently these are the ones that we're still missing. So switching gears from where, where we're collecting data and while we're collecting data, moving to how we're collecting data, our, our sampling points are a single fixed radius um, point, 40, a single 48 foot fixed radius sample. And in, inside that radius, we'll, we'll tally all trees with a diameter of five inches or greater. And then we've chosen a subsampling approach on four microplots. The microplots have a 6.8 foot radius sample. And inside each of those four, we'll measure saplings, so trees less than five inches, as well as seedlings to monitor any kind of regeneration. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll apply this same sample across the entire country. When, when, we, do, when we are on a sample, we'll also break things out by um, land use classification. So any trees, imagine this is my 48 foot circle on the screen. Any trees that fall on the golf course will be tagged golf course, the residential area versus the, the right of way. So we'll be able to tell, you know, what type of conditions were these trees growing in even within the same, the same plot. What kind of data we collect on our plots from bringing some data items in from our traditionally forested sites basic crown class, crown ratio information to, to get the, the vigor of the trees down. Even from, from a um, merchantability standpoint, from a timber production standpoint, we're bringing in um, trees that meet merchantability standards called growing stock, as well as rough and rotten trees. And those are the trees that will either not meet merchantability standards due to roughness and or rottenness. We'll also give a, a tree grade from a timber perspective, a tree grade to each tree over, over 11 inches. Also monitor various traditional damages. And it's just kind of a, a glimpse of the timber centric approach that still remains from the core program. But then we're also adding in um, I tree variables that allow us to get at the ecosystem, the other ecosystem services that the trees do provide. Things like crown widths, foliage absent, veg cover, surface cover, it will tag, tag trees as um, planted street trees or riparian trees, and also expand our, our damage list um, beyond the traditional damages you might see um, on, on a traditional forested plot. So that's, that's, that's the, the variables we collect on the plot, shifting over to access to the data on the, on the work that's already been done. We've got um, 10 complete data sets, meaning a complete data set, meaning we've completed the the full seven year cycle at least once, or out west is a 10 year cycle. So we've got 10, 10 data sets complete, 11 or more than 50% complete. And then we, we make all of our raw data available, in what we call the data marks. So anyone can log on and, and download these data. 
We've got six of the 10 completed cities currently in the data mart. And we'd hope to have four more added, hopefully by the end of um, end of June. The next next, avail next way to get access to the data would also be through the MyCities tree application. Currently, we have got five of the 10 cities um, available in the MyCities tree app. And we hope by the end of um, June to add the three Missouri cities as well as some Chicago. And then we've got two completed reports. And those are the first two cities we did outside of Baltimore being um, Austin and Houston, Texas. As of 2019, those, those 10 cities that were completed were in Austin, Houston, and San Antonio, Texas, as well as San Diego, California, Kansas City, Springfield, and St. Louis, Missouri, as well as Portland, Oregon, DC, and Chicago. We weren't able to get Baltimore wrapped up last year in 2020. We'll add that to 2021's work, and we'll have about seven more cities completed by the end of this field season. Then looking forward over the next three years, 2022 through 2024, we'll be adding, we'll have another five complete data sets. So five cities completed each year. So 15 more cities over the next three years, followed by another 11 in 26 and 27. So, so plenty of data in, in the pipeline coming towards, um, coming towards production. That the next round of cities in, um, that we should have a complete data set by the end of 21 would be Baltimore, Des Moines, on the other Portland, Portland, Maine, Minneapolis, Providence, and Madison and Milwaukee. So that's kind of the status of all of our data collection across, across the country. The next step, once that data is complete, after, after data processing is pushing forth um, a, a complete seven year report on, a, a comprehensive report on what we found in that first cycle of data. Currently, we just have Houston and Austin and currently San Diego is currently in um, program manager level review after which it'll go to the publication shop and then be published. It's, it's been a long process, but we're, we're getting better at it as we go. Um, when I look at those reports that we send out after, after a full seven years, I'll, I'll, in order to keep it consistent across the country to be able to compare cities, most of the meat of the, meat of the project is, is the same city by city. So it's all, all using a template. But to, to capture unique uniqueness or special issues with regarding any given city, we'll have you know a customized introduction and special topic section, as well as customized conclusion and take-home message section. I mentioned about so that that's access to the data via reporting. Another access towards the data is the data mart. The data marts where folks can come and actually download com complete data sets of what's been published. Um, I, I would say that. For the average person, you might you might need some some additional database skills in order to, to mine data out of the data mart. Okay, just just a the it's a little bit more complex for the than compared to what the average user can interact with. I I I cannot interact with it. It's beyond my beyond my skill set. But because of that, we've invested more 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 dollars with a partnership with the Texas Forest Service, what we call the My Cities Tree application. This will cover all trees in the program. And where I said that the database is more is, is complex to work with, when I think of the My Cities Tree app, I'm thinking like recliner and iPad as far as um, ex exploring summary data for your city spatially. Um, very easy to use and, and still able to run reports and such. I would think this is our main conduit to the masses in terms of getting, getting out data and sharing data with folks. And then kind of kind of sitting right between the, the data mart and the My Cities Tree app, um, we're working on a, a new um, data summary tool, um, National Urban Tree Statistics um, Program. It's more like a, a tabling program, a means by which the, the average researcher could um, hit off the database with a much more user-friendly front end. Um, so I, I, think, I think data mart, I think high level super users, My Cities Trees, I think average users across the board, and I think um, this um, tabling tool, I'd say mid-level re research, um, probably most of our internal people are, are using um, this tool here. And all, all that helps us tell the story of, of our forests across the country from both, both traditional and urban. Just taking a look at some of the figures from the Austin report and thinking in terms of um, potential um, pest influence like the Asian longhorn beetle, 
um, about, about 19% of the, the, the tree population within the Austin survey is, is susceptible to um, the Asian longhorn beetle. And the comp compensatory value to replace all those trees at some point in the future is about $2 billion. So it's all about telling the story, but it's, it's one thing to talk about you know, the risk, forest health risks. When you start putting it into the context of you know, almost 20% of your population is, is at risk, and and it's about a twenty, and that's a twenty billion dollar investment to replace that. It, it, I can kind of really tell the story depending on who you're talking to. I copied this out of one of the local newspapers down in Austin. Just some things that stuck stuck out to me after the, after they reviewed the data was that about sixty percent of the trees in Austin were five inches or less. They remove about almost two million tons of carbon dioxide annually. It was really neat to see that about 90% of Austin's trees um, were, were native to Texas. I guess, I guess that really surprised me. And then in, ter in terms of telling the story, I mean, here, here in the Midwest, the town I live in, it's 99.99% green ash. I mean, the, the town was built in the 50s and they planted nothing but green ash. EAB is a really big deal. And I mean, it, it's sad to see all the trees dying. But at the same time, it's also I'm kind of trying to look at the bright side. It's just a great opportunity to interact with landowners, interact with nonprofits about how, how to reforest the city and how to do it the right way. And you know, explaining that it's not just about planting trees; it's about providing budgets to maintain the trees they do plant. Just kind of thinking big picture that even though we do see this devastation all around us, there's also there's also opportunities associated with 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 such such travesty in terms of you know educating the public and sharing information. Um, it's really a good opportunity if we spend the time to invest time in sharing that story. And, you know, and when it comes down to it, the, the right message or creating relatable text to the right people at the right time can really make the make all the difference. I and mean, even talking about our elected officials and such, they will tell the story, quantify and monetize the story of these trees to help them make the best best budgetary decisions that might help us manage those trees over, over time. I'll try to go through a. a a brief um, demonstration of a one minor application within the, the larger My Cities Tree app. app. And just, just starting out, it will cover every, every city that we, we, that we interact with across the country. But currently there's just five cities loaded, the, the three Texas cities plus San Diego and um, Portland. I'm, I'm sure hoping that Chicago and um, the three Missouri cities, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm hoping they're in by the end of June. That, that's my goal now. Once, once you're inside the application, it's a matter of you know, cho choosing a city and choosing a theme. You normally have four or five themes per, per city, and it, it's pretty much up to the city to, to, to make that decision in terms of, of um, what types of themes they might like to see. Sometimes we talk about the heat island effect. Other times we talk about ecoregions or city growth or some equity issues um, using some census block data. It's pretty much up to working with the city to, to, to find their own themes, how they like to spatially display these data. And once the theme selected, we'll develop individual subclasses within, within each theme in, in order to help tell that story. So Re Rebecca from the state of Texas put this, this, this display together, looking at the impact of um, Emerald Ashbor in Austin. So it's a, a, an ability to, to first pick a theme. So in this case, their, their themes were land cover, city growth, watershed or ecoregion. So she picked um, watershed. And then within the watershed, she had four different watersheds listed. She picked two of the watersheds. And picking these two watersheds, they represented about 65% of the area of the city, about 77% of the city's population, and about 65% of our plots were located um, in, in this area. Then what, what, once they've got that area defined to, to look at, there's the opportunity to look at um, number of trees, um, carbon, compensatory value, leaf area index, index, energy savings, runoff avoidance, pollution, and, and, and health benefits. So in this, in this example, we picked um, runoff. About 45 of the runoff mitigation occurs within this area about 29 um, million um, cubic feet per year of the entire city is 65 million cubic feet per year. So roughly about half that mitigation happens on um, within these two watersheds. 
and looking at the species in, in those areas, about almost 9% of the total runoff avoided is based on the ash species growing um, within this area. And then on top of that, about a quarter of that ash runoff um, avoidance it happens on um, public land versus private land. So it just kind of gives you a, a, an inkling of where, where those trees exist, what benefits those trees provide, and who owns those trees, meaning which more or less means who, who manages those trees over time. And I'll end with two other, um, we started out with the, with the three components of the FIA program. So we mentioned long-term monitoring, which we just talked about. That next component was what we're referring to as ur urban wood flows. About almost 15 million, <coughs> excuse me, about 15 million tons of um, urban woods removed each year from urban areas. And that's more from the entire national forest system as far as what's removed on an annual basis. And plenty of interest in, um, in, in looking at how this wood is used, gener generators, processors, and producers. We did spend some time and money in, in Baltimore to evaluate this. And the more we dug into it, the more complicated it got and the harder it was to translate what we found in Baltimore to other cities in terms of a national program. So we kind of backed off this a little bit and our goal now is to wait. Well, we're all, we've almost got our first full remeasurement data set from Austin coming up either this year or next year. And once we compare those two data sets, we'd like to, we'll probably get a better idea what kind of true change we can monitor and how we might be able to apply that to urban wood flows. And then the, the last piece of um, the last component of the survey on the woodland owner survey and the urban side of the ledger, we have the urban owner survey um, so far, we've got a, a pilot completed in Austin, and now Austin's in, in um, remeasurement mode. So they have an, an annual survey that goes out each year in Austin. So just, just like our, our plot works, annualized as a subsample is done each year, we're using that same effort in, um, in, in the owner survey, owner survey program. Baltimore had an accelerated survey, meaning they collapsed the seven years down to a single year after which they'll go into an annual survey. That, that data has already been collected and, and is, current un, is currently under analysis. And the template that comes out of Baltimore will be applied to, to Houston, which also had an accelerated survey. But the Houston survey was also intensified a, a fourfold increase in the number of letters that went out to um, potential landowners. That data has also been received and is currently being processed. Wisconsin did a pilot back um, probably three or four years ago that's been published. Currently, they're not, they're not producing an annualized survey, but we're, we're hoping we can make that happen in the near future. And we've got three other cities, um, Denver, Portland, and St. Louis. They're all entering year three of a five-year survey. And once the five-year survey is over, that'll be annualized moving forward um, also. Now, I think I saw Dexter's name in the chat, um, and Dexter's our, our, our main lead person working along with Brett Butler to handle these, um, the, the urban version of these um, surveys. So thanks for all of your work, Dexter, if you're still there. So that, that, that's kind of a conclusion of the, the three main pieces of um, the three main components of the FIA program. And all those three components work both in rural areas and in urban areas. So with that, um, I know we kind of try to squeeze a lot of big picture information into a, a very short time period. But with that, I'd like to maybe save a bunch of time to ask um, so answer some of the many questions I think I'd assume you'd have at this point in the game. So Mark, thank you for your time. Yeah, what amazing work. And I know it's going to be so useful for all of us in our own work. Um, and I'm glad that you could share this because uh, with this group, because I not only know there's interest, but I, I imagine a lot of us, this is new, new news. Um, so appreciate all the pointing to resources. If you wouldn't mind, um, stopping to share your screen and, and we can share out your, your contact info afterwards and we could sort of sure. open up the space to conversation. Uh, I noticed, Kinsey, did you keep track of some of the great questions that um, were coming in? Yeah, yeah, they're all um, in the chat. So I'll just go down um, by order of when they came in. So from Frank Rogers at Kikapin Institute, he asks, um, one plot per 60,000 acres. I would think that an urban area is more heterogeneous and would require a more intense plot count. How accurate is the survey and was there a different outcome in states that added more plots? 
it's, it's one plot for every, every 6,000 acres, not 60,000, one plot for every 6,000, but even at the 6,000 acre stage, we, we, still, we still need to, I, I can't say too much about the data at that rate until I can look at an area with at least 200 plots in it. So, so in, inside the city limits, we feel comfortable going with Dave Nowak's experience with iTree that 200 plots is enough plots to say something about a given area. But once I move outside the city limits to where there is that, the, the spot plots are more, more dispersed at the 6,000 acre, acre area, I need to start adding counties together, together, together until I can get an area with, with, with at least 200 plots before I can even speak to it. So I've, I've got less flexibility in the areas that I can describe because I don't have enough plots there. And to the, to the comparing that to, let's say Missouri, where they did intensify the plots from um, something more than one to every 6,000 acres, I guess I, although that data is being processed now, I don't have data to share to tell you the difference other than in most cases, I can't tell you anything about those areas that are only one plot for every 6,000 acres. And I do not have the funding to put in more plots. Okay, thank you. So to, to be determined, it sounds like as the as the program continues to grow. Um, from Krista Heinlein in Philly, if the program has a seven year cycle and some states are doing three year cycles, how does that impact continuity, if at all? It all, it all comes down to the to when you get your base sample up, that I, I can still compare results regardless of where they, where they come from. But probably the, the biggest thing about that initial, that initial acceleration is it gets us, the sweet spot is looking at the remeasurement data, the change data. So the quicker I can get to that base sample being done, the quicker I can get to remeasurement being done. And I, I, we, have, we haven't had any trouble comparing um, five-year cycle, the seven-year cycle states. It's just, it just gets us to that quicker remeasurement, remeasurement um, point. The quicker we get to the remeasurement point, the quicker we get to that rolling average moving forward. So even if things are sloppy during like that first decade, they do get to that sweet spot with the rolling averages moving forward quicker. That, that's why they made the investment initially to get to that sweet spot quicker. Thank you. Uh, from Brittany Winkie in New York, does the UFIA method methodology account for natural trees, meaning not street trees or trees in landscaped parks in urban settings? The, the samples random, so wherever the, the, the plots will fall randomly throughout, throughout a given city. And then one, once the plants, once the plots established, we'll, we'll just measure whatever's there. That might be, there might be street trees. There might be a mix of street trees and um, natural trees. There might be a mix of, um, um, develop the wherever the plots fall. We'll measure the trees that are present on the plot, but we don't purposely put plots in natural areas versus non-natural areas. The plots are randomly assigned throughout the city, and whatever is found on those plots, we, we tally, and we're able to tell. We'll, we'll, we'll tag the plot each each tree whether it's growing in a maintained area or a natural area. So even within any plot, you could tell which trees were planted which trees are natural regeneration, which trees are growing in a maintained manicured area versus those trees that are growing in more of a natural setting. So you can tease out which trees are which, but we don't purposely put plots in a natural area versus a non-natural area. Thanks. And then the last question that's in the chat is from me, who conducts the boots on the ground assessments? Is it UFSF, USFS employees, contractors, volunteers? I had like five more slides that said that what to, what we do, but I didn't think, I think I was running out of time. Um, our, our main business model is working with contractors. Mm -hmm. So across the board, we've got federal contractors and um, in, in DC, um, Earl, Earl and Casey worked out a deal where they paid for contractors themselves. So they were, where I have federal contractors, Earl, Earl was using um, city contractors. The state of Missouri um, came up with the money, but they use our federal contractors to get their work done. The city of Portland, Maine shipped in city employees to get some work done. The city of Portland, Oregon, um, I use city employees to get some work done. But from co contracting, my biggest fear is that the contracting pool is not deep enough to handle all the work we have. 
if anyone's interested in learning more about becoming a contractor, please um, reach out and please share my name with anyone you might know in your networks that might be interested in contract work. That, that's a major and concern of our, our business model moving forward. Not, not to scare people off, but Mark did share with us the, uh, the manual uh, <laughs> uh, for, for how to properly inventory. And, it, and it's, it's a Bible, I would say. <laughs> It's, 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 it, and and, and it's, we've got a, a thick field guide and an intense certification session on like 20 pages on how to measure a diameter. But it, it's all to get that re-measurement data. We want to make sure we're, we're, you measure it one way, I measure it a different way. I, I don't want to measure that over time. I don't want to, want to measure how that tree is changing over time. So it's critical that I measure it the same way today as somebody will measure it seven years from now. And, and, and because of that, 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 that definitely increases um, operating expenses across, across the board. Right. Thank you. Uh, so that wraps up all of the questions that are in the chat. Does anyone else want to pipe in by voice? There's a lot of fantastic information. Lots yeah, of the, future thought. The, the, the first question about the, the one plot for every 6,000 acres in, in cases like the Plain states, the figure in North Dakota down to Nebraska, statewide, I have so few plots that I might, I might have to look at all those states as one sample area because I, I don't have enough plots to say enough about just the urban areas of North Dakota. I might have to lump, lump all those four states together in order, in order to speak to that. So in some cases, that just it's a really coarse, big picture survey. And without additional funding, I can't say more than that. Great, thank you. All right, well, if we have no further questions, I just wanna give a big thanks to Mark, a round of applause. It was a fascinating presentation. Hey Mark, uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for having me. Other than the video that we'll post, uh, are you able to share the slide deck with us that we could share out? Yeah, sure. Because I know there were links in there and other useful information and you know, really well presented is just, amazing this work um, I, 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 don't, I don't have I don't, I don't have any text associated with the slides because I make it up as I go but so I don't I don't have the text for the slides but um if you do have any questions after looking at the slides again by all means please reach out well we could replay the video with uh with the slideshow and <laughs> sure. re relive the event no just <laughs> kidding uh I just wanted to remind people we will be meeting uh, in a month's time again um please join us and uh can see I can't remember who we're hosting but uh, Casey Iteralde from the DC Department of Transportation. That's right. I think that one, one thing I want, I want to leave with is that, I mean, even just mentioning Casey's name, we, we can't get any of this work done without our cooperators. We would, we would never have a full data set for DC without Earl and Casey working with us. S same with, um, like even, even in Chicago, you know, we had some late money come in, we were able to maneuver and get some data accelerated, but even, even working with partners, um, partners at their Arboretum and then partners with the state, we, we can't do this without, without partners. Even if, even if the partners are not collecting data, even if the partners don't have money, without working together with these folks, we'd never be able to get where we are now. For, we'd, we'd never have 40 cities without partners. So thank all, thank all of you, thank you, all of our partners, thank you. We'll have a great May, everyone. We'll see you in June. And then I think we have July all scheduled. I think the next we're looking out to September, Kinsey, for uh, speakers. So I think we're set for the next couple of months. But if you or anyone else you know wants to join us to share in the work, um, please reach out. We have the rest yes. of 2021 available after September. Yep. Um, and we will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to this recording as well as Mark's slides. And I'll try to post any links that are also in those slides so you can find them easily. Thank you much. Right. Thanks everyone.